And now, fortunately, this field of image-guided surgery is booming, so a lot of funds, both by NSF, NIH, and commercial ventures have been allocated to it. In fact, um, just um, last, last month, I really, at my company, I actually released a segmentation product, and that would have been completely unheard of three, four years ago, because firstly, people didn't understand the importance of segmentation. Secondly, there was just not enough effort in making these algorithms computationally tractable so that they could run on you know, a spark station, let's say, in under two minutes. But there's interest, there's you know, funding. I, I could afford to put a person full time on the problem saying that all we're going to do is optimize this algorithm, not just from a code point of view, but algorithmically. And I came up with fantastic results. And now, you know, suddenly, you know, I, I can bet you a year from now, every neurosurgeon will know what segmentation is simply because they can press a button and out come 3D models like the one that I showed you. So, any more digressions here? No. But some of these questions, you, you guys are already on the next level of how limiting this approach is going to be. So I was going to try to tell you how great it is, but <laughs> it has all these limitations. But the, the nice thing is that in a probabilistic, in a Bayesian framework, you can keep folding in all this other information using priors. You know, if you want to build in a prior, in fact, the spatial information point that you brought up earlier about the location, you know, how, how to use the proximity of different structures to help you segment it. When I formulated that, um, I, I actually folded that in a prior in a Bayesian framework. And so then, with, if you remember your Bayes rule or when we get into it, you'll see it's just a matter of simply multiplying out the probabilities, adding them, and dividing them by you know, some funky number, and you get the answer. And that's why I like a probabilistic uh, framework here, because the information by the very nature of this problem we're tra trying to solve here, of segmentation of medical images, there's information that bears upon it from so many different angles. And if you have a framework, a formalism, that's going to allow you to fold in every new piece of information, then your framework, you've won something by choosing that framework. Because every time, let's say you wanted, you know, if you had not chosen a probabilistic framework, you'd be going back to the drawing board and saying, okay, now my algorithm can handle intensity. How do I fold in spatial information? So that's, um, so I'm a, I'm a big fan of using um, Bayesian statistics all, all the time. So um, didn't we have a statistician in this class also? Where are we? No. Is that you? Psychologist. Psychologist, statistician? All right. <laughs> We're calling you a statistician. Didn't you write? <laughs> <laughs> I'm Sunday, I'll be a computer scientist. All right, all right, okay. We're more than one half. Now we're yeah. at the next level. Let's see if they actually know what any of these are. I know, I know. <laughs> That's a <laughs> smart game. <laughs> well, Anticlimactic here. Okay, what's your random variable? But, yeah, so actually, um, I, if you want to venture in here, it's like, you know, I, the ba so there's, I'm giving my position on Bayesian, the Bayesian method of solving these problems, but it, you can feel free to tell people that there are other methods. I'm just not going to say. <laughs> okay. There's a lot of other methods. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right, all right, all right. Okay, I asked for that one. All right, back to planet Earth here. We're going to go to, I'm going to go through some of these um, terms here, and I'm going to ask you guys to um, define them just so I can feel extremely confident moving on to the next one. Anyone want to venture what a random variable is? Give me your, what do you think of a random variable? It's, it's a variable in, that's some value you're getting from your experiment. Uh-huh. In pixel on your MR. Yeah. An intensity value. Uh-huh. Yeah. Or it could be something that's derived from it. It's, it's a random variable. It can even be, you know, it doesn't have to necessarily do with the probability. Right? It could just, so it's just a function you define. Yeah, that's exactly, that's exactly right. It's a function that's defined on the domain of your experiment. Okay? And so, by the way, all of these slides are on the web page. I just um, didn't print them out now, so you wouldn't know my answers here. So, I'm going to, here's an example. Could someone fill this example for me that if we have an experiment, which is two coin tosses, um, what's the sample space? We've covered the term sample space, right? Someone wanted to venture what is in the sample space for this experiment? So I can feel comfortable using the term sample space. Wonderful. Uh, an example of a random variable on this space? All right. How did you know? That's in Drake's book. Right. It's like the only, you know, I tried to think of other intuitive random variables on this, so I came up with two times the number of heads. So here's what we got. 
Okay, one, one distinction I wanted to repeat here is um, make sure everyone understands what the difference between a discrete and a continuous random variable is. Anyone? What is the big distinction between a dis when I tell you a random variable is discrete and when it's um, continuous? What comes to mind for you? It has a fixed number of possible values or varies over a, a, a domain. Right. Okay. Plus, yeah, yeah. But domain is the key word there. The different a discrete random variable is defined on a discrete domain, right? right? And a continuous random variable is on a continuous domain. So is that, does the term domain make sense to everyone? So a discrete random variable would be something which has, you know, which is only defined on x equals 1, 2, 5, 8, 10. While a continuous would be on the line between 0 and 10. Perfect. Very OK. PDF. Um, anyone care to define PDF for me? What is a probability density function? I'm not going to go in the fine points between you know, PMF and PDF. I, I assume you guys have already, you know, most of the world doesn't even call them PMFs. I don't, I don't think I had heard the term PMF before um, I took you know, the course at MIT. So I'm not going to worry about that. But the probability density function, anyone care to define that for me? I'm not going to look at you. Anyone? Uh, just. Intuitively, what, is a, what does, when I tell you that this is a probability density function, yeah, think in terms of an experiment. What does a probability density function give you if you have an experiment? It's the probability that you'll get each of the values in the domain. Yeah. yeah. And intuitively, that, it's the, the sentence that you said has an implicit discreteness with it. You know, for each event, each value in the domain. So if, you have, if your domain has points 1, 2, 3, 4, signing that. But probability density function, the terminology we're using, is with each, it can be a continuous event space. Right. But I'm just, so you're exactly. Using the same terminology for discrete and continuous? Well, you know, as we get into the, the program that we write for MATLAB, I'm going to present everything to you in the continuous domain. But once you start, you know, You'll be wise to ask the question at that point that, yes, your image intensities are supposed to be continuous, but hey, you've got an image here between values from 0 to 255. So the distinction between continuous and discrete is going to blur here. Conceptually, it's continuous. And I'm, you know, if you do ask me the question, I have a very nice canned answer for you. But it's, you're going to think, think continuous. All the functions we're going to write are going to be defined on the continuous range. So it's not that if I give you an intensity between, you know, if I give you an intensity value of 120.5, your function is going to fall apart because it's only defined at discrete values. That's not going to happen. So conceptually, everything we're going to do is continuous. But when you implement it in the program, you're going to notice that it's all discrete because we have discrete values. And if you really push it, I'll make you blur the images so you will actually have values that are between real integers. But that's. Uh, we, we have made the distinction clear, and you know, we have made the distinction so far in the course. But realize that you've got to understand both, but things are going to get blurry from now on. That's very comforting, isn't it? All right, so here's uh, PDF. Uh, here is a. What, when you think of a PDF, typically, if I were to ask you, you know, what are two characteristics of a probability density function, meaning what are two quantities that if you knew about, you would be able to picture, you'd be able to visualize that density, even if you didn't know a whole lot about it. Any thoughts? Total area underneath it is one. Fair, fair. I'm even looking, you know, these, I'm looking at things that I'm sure you guys have done already, so I'm not going after area. But um, when you think in terms of a, a Gaussian, where Sorry? The mean and the variance. Yeah. Th those are the ones I'm getting at. There are many, you know, there, there are many more, but these are two typically that you think of these two characteristics. And in some cases, they'll define the full distribution for you. In other cases, they won't. But they, they're just the sort of comforting things. If you know them, you feel like you have a handle on the probability, on the probability density. And, um, and you know, an interesting thing is most people tend to pro model a lot of processes using Gaussians very simply because you feel like you've got your hands around them just by knowing two numbers, like the mean and the variance. So the mean is also referred to as the expected value. 